Hello, I'm Bill Zogby. I'm the Chair of Cardiology here at Houston Methodist and the DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center. And it's a pleasure to have with us Dr. Tommy Wang, Chief of Cardiology and the Head of the Heart and Vascular Center at Vanderbilt University. Tommy, it's great to have you. Thanks a lot, Bill. Really appreciate really it. Really enjoyed your grand rounds, and I uh, would like our viewers to take a look at that because we always talk about precision medicine in, in so many ways because this is something that is on the radar screen as of the past few years. And you've done an amazing job, you know, you and your colleagues, be it from, from the Boston area and Vanderbilt to take a look at that with your biobank and everything else. But at the same time, you, you shared with us the challenges that we have when we look at various areas, be it genomics, metabolomics, proteomics, and all this, and that we haven't added as much as we would like to our traditional ways, or at least the more known ways of, of classifying risk. Your view regarding that, I'm saying one is, is this because they're autorelated, autocorrelated one way or another? Could we be looking at the wrong thing? And I'm saying, is this, uh, are we trying to predict events or development of atherosclerosis? <laughs> because the length of time to get to an event is so long that having a snapshot as to where you are at, at some point in time may not be so predictive going on with epigenetics, so many other risk factors. I mean, this is, I see, the big challenge, and I think you, you hinted on that, your perspectives on that. Yeah, well, first off, thanks a lot, Dr. Zog. We really appreciate the opportunity to visit. And I think your question captures many of the challenges that uh, we as an investigators face. This is an exciting time, as you pointed out. There's so much information coming in, clinical information that's being collected. All the molecular technologies are giving us a lot of capability many advances in our understanding of biology. But to your point, how to translate that information into something that's clinically useful has been always the, the challenge and I think remains the challenge in, in thinking forward. So to answer your question, I think some of the reasons that for cardiovascular disease specifically, that the information that we have from genomics and proteomics and metabolomics may not be as useful as, as we might assume they should be uh, uh, are again, as you point out, because cardiovascular disease, in some sense, is a stochastic process. Um, we don't know for sure which of people who have atherosclerosis are on any given day going to have a myocardial infarction right. or going to develop heart failure. And so, to your point again, predicting the future is a very challenging thing. We're not particularly in cardiovascular disease. Absolutely. Yeah. So in, in most of these studies, has, has it been that you're looking, when you say development of coronary disease, are we talking about events or some other phenotypic uh, look at, you know, the heart and vasculature and say, well, oh, we have atherosclerosis yes. now, a calcium score, some plaque development, things like this, because those events are even much later. Right. Right. And should we look at an earlier event, almost like a surrogate marker of risk? Yes. How have you, I mean, those studies that you yep. mentioned to us today, are they looking at events or should we look at an earlier event because yeah. it's so long, so long down the line? Yeah, good question. So traditionally, we've looked at events. And the reason to look at events is at the end of the day, that's, that's what, what we as, <laughs> as clinicians and patients care about. And so someone may have coronary disease, but if they never have an MI or they never have a stroke from the cerebral vascular disease, arguably it's less important to them that they happen to have some plaque in their coronary arteries. But to your point, we're then talking about decades over which we have to capture a stochastic process. When will that plaque rupture? Will it thrombose? Exactly. Will it cause a big MI? Will there be sudden death? Or will it just be angina? And so. There has been an interest in seeing whether we can look at more intermediate phenotypes. I was just wondering about yeah. that, whether... Yeah. So th that's one. The other question to you is, you know, sparked by, by your grand rounds, is are we looking too early? And what I'm saying is I'm looking at all these biomarkers, proteomics, and, and so many other things. Uh, what happens at the time of event? If I look at these biomarkers, close to the time of event, either during 
or after? Since you have your bio view, I guess yes. um, it'll be interesting to see if you had a uh, these biomarkers at baseline somewhere, they didn't have a cardiovascular event and then they were readmitted again. Yep. Are these changed a lot? Yeah. You know, obviously something has changed. Yeah. And I just wonder because it is such a dynamic field, unless you're talking about genes and even genes, you have epigenetic factors right. that, will, that right. will influence gene expression. Yeah. So I'm just wondering about that. Because I, I'm seeing that we're trying to predict something too far out yeah. and many things are happening in between. Yeah, it's a great question. And I think that one of the opportunities that we have now that we have the ability to collect clinical and biochemical and tissue data from patients that we see in the clinic because we're now using electronic medical records and we have access to automated systems for collecting specimens, that we could start answering the questions that you're asking, which we were never able to answer before right. because we've been reliant on community-based cohorts, which have been extremely valuable, but don't necessarily give us the proximal information that you're talking about. That all being said, it's obviously a tenet of prevention that you want to start early. Uh, so for, we don't know, for instance, that even if we knew that in any individual that in the next month they're at high risk of an event, we don't know at that point whether there are things that we can do to prevent that effectively. Obviously, many of the catheter-based and percutaneous therapies are not necessarily things that have been proven for plaque stabilization. They're more plaque treatment. And so many of the tools in our armamentarium are tools right. that are designed for long-range risk reduction, things like statins and other medications. I liked also the way you, towards the end of the Grand Rounds, you talked about, yes, precision medicine, but also you have to be realistic, maybe changing or moving the population because we know so, ma so much as to what, how you can prevent coronary disease, right? And effect and moving the population towards a healthier population. Yep. I mean, we could reduce coronary disease and effect of coronary disease at least 40% of the population. And even in the United States, yeah. we haven't reached the target of decent blood pressure um, treatment and cholesterol treatment. And you're targeting, you're targeting also a population in your study where access to care yep. is challenging. And if you think about even the world where it's even much more magnified than actually going up as opposed to going down, yep. uh, basic treatment of things that we don't even have to discover can make a major dent in coronary heart disease. So we have to think about the population and good treatment yep. in addition, hopefully getting into some of the newer ways and maybe better risk stratifying, which is challenging for coronary disease as opposed yes. to neurological diseases, inherited diseases that are same, monogenic as opposed to polygenic. That's right. Yeah, I, I think to your point, we, my hope is that our appropriate focus on precision medicine and learning from precision medicine, advancing precision medicine, does not take our attention away exactly. from population health. And in, in my mind, they're not mutually exclusive. They complement each I, other, I think actually. Exactly. I think both at the patient level and at the research level, we want to advance both. And there are so many things in terms of the health of the population that we have not adequately addressed. And it's something that we're going to need to focus on moving forward, even in this era of precision medicine. Well, we thank you again for joining us. And best of luck in your endeavors. I think you're doing wonderful work. We're very proud. Thanks and very thanks much. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it.